Um, and then again, encouraging ethnic and cultural symbols, concepts, sayings, and stories as part of the dialogue. Uh, providers can adhere to an intervention and still use the language and the symbols and the metaphors of culture in their work, and that enriches the intervention rather than a sterile uh, intervention, again, where the client is expected to adapt to the way we talk about things. Let's talk about things similarly to the way you talk about things. And that takes a culturally competent uh, program and a culturally competent therapist to do that. Um, knowledge from respecting cultural values and practices. And again, we gain this information about interventions through our experience with how it's working. One of the things that's incumbent upon the source of the referral is to check back in with the client who's been referred to what their experience was in this intervention. Were you welcome? Were you respected? Were you, did you get the intervention itself? And then select, select, set uh, collaboration goals that are consonant with culture and context. So looking for conflict between the therapeutic needs and the cultural norms is always a topic of problem solving. And I'll talk a little bit about how to do that problem solving in a minute. Um, a strength-based approach, of course, is an incredibly important culturally competent adaptation, supporting values and strengths from the culture of origin, paying attention to religious affiliation, support of extended family, resilience, humor, using those strengths in the intervention. Adapting methods to culture. Now this is the evidence-based world. It makes people incredibly nervous. You're going to do what to my intervention? You're going to adapt it? Well, there are ways to do that that are um, partly drawn by, uh, partly by drawing on the experience of the developers of the intervention. There are ways to do that with measurement of adherence and fidelity so that you know you're still delivering the intervention appropriate. And of course, there are interventions, um, we'll talk about two examples, that are in and of themselves adaptable. That is, the intervention itself is flexible, um, lending cultural competence to it. Right? And so that's an important consideration. Are you going to be able to do anything um, to accommodate the cultural realities of your clientele, or are you forced to do things in a certain way? And so that's an important question. And then finally, considering the cultural context and implementation, similar to the last one, but we're saying that we have to recognize that in our assessment procedures and our understanding of what's going on with the child or family, we have to be attuned to um, the, the, the research base that we actually have about cultural context <coughs> of problem behavior. So I have an example, um, uh, well, I'll show you that. We're just talking about, for example, interventions around stress and coping. And I was talking to the intervention uh, developers, and they weren't aware of the concept of a culture of stress. And if we're going to be doing an intervention for coping with stress, and we're going to apply it to uh, Hispanic immigrant families, one of the things we have to be attuned to is that there's a special kind of stressor that's related to immigration and acculturation. And so that's part of how we consider these things. And so, for example, I show uh, these people the uh, Hispanic stress inventory which talks about the particular stresses in parenting when your parents are acculturated at one rate and children are acculturated at another rate, creates stress in families, creates pressure on parents, creates difficulty in implementing interventions. And these are just examples of items. Children are very dependent on the parents are ready for, right? It's difficult to decide how strict to be with children. Children want to be parented like American kids are parented, and parents want to parent like um, uh, parents are due from their culture of origin. And so if we're going to attend to culture, we need to be um, aware of there's a whole research base of the impact of a culture of stress on parent-child relationships and conflict. Or there's an immigration factor in the stress inventory that you know, there's a whole set of stressors that are driven by the uh, context of the immigration. And so it's not necessarily um, the case that every evidence-based practice is going to have a specific module that deals with acculturation. But what you can expect as a person who is referring um, clients of color to, to interventions is do they have the capacity, for example, to serve this um, population? Do they have familiar with Culturally multi-generational families. So how do you do 
this and maintain the scientific spirit um, of, 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 of evidence-based practice. And there's, you know, the idea that there's a incompatibility between the scientific method and cultural competence is not one that I accept. Mm -hmm. right? Though when I draw boxes and arrows, I realize that I am putting myself in a particular Western frame of mind that may not be exactly the way people um, from other cultural cultures think about solving problems, box A, box B, and box C. But this is a strategy for providers who tend to be trained also in this uh, scientific mindset when they're implementing evidence-based practices. So how do you uh, marry these two? And Stephen Lopez uh, um, has written for many, many years on supervising and training and multicultural awareness um, for clinicians who are primarily scientific practitioners. And what he talks about is using these scientific methods to incorporate culture in a systematic way that ultimately um, leads to more effective services. And so these cultural hypotheses are things that agencies should develop a capacity to do. That is, make an informed guess as to possible cultural factors affecting treatment, gather evidence through observation, questioning, and consultation, intervene appropriately, gather evidence of the effectiveness of the intervention. A very simple loop of hypothetical deductive reasoning but what that does is, is we want clinicians implementing any practice, and evidence-based practices in particular, to be actively problem-solving and thinking about the impact that culture has on their ability to deliver their intervention, rather than simply saying, we tried to implement this intervention in a certain community, people didn't like it, people didn't come, we couldn't, it, we couldn't engage people or have them say treatment, and so, Instead, we're saying engage this problem head on in the same way you would engage everything else in the evidence-based practice. So that's a, that's the, uh, I'll come back and show you a case with that to show you how it works in a specific example. Another sort of cultural adaptation technique um, that I recommend that agencies can use and that referrers can look for is the capacity to use um, the evidence-based practice of motivational interviewing, which has um, demonstrated itself to be um, a culturally competent practice in several ways. Um, one is, there's an article just out of American Psychologist this month by uh, William Miller summarizing the decades of motivational interviewing, and one of the sturdy findings that they've had is that motivational interviewing actually works um, slightly better um, um, in clients of color um, than it does in the general population. It works well in the general population, and it works particularly well in uh, Native American clients, African American clients, and Latino clients. Um, and it, and, and the, the spirit of the intervention lends itself to that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so there's evidence for MI. There's an inherent client-centered and, direct, and directive approach. So it naturally marries this tension between being culturally competent, which is being ecologically aware, um, holistic, and client-centered, and evidence-based, which would be fairly directive and driven and target-focused. And motivational interviewing actually provides a nice bridge for that. It has shown itself to be a nice bridge in trials where it's used um, as an uh, antecedent to an evidence-based practice. It works well that way in addition to its other forms. There are some culturally specific adaptations. I'll show you a little bit from a, um, a Native American adaptation of motivational interviewing that's been um, developed. Um, and as I said, it has uh, flexibility and implementation within or before other empirically supported treatments or other based practices. And the thing I like about motivational interviewing in terms of culture is that it, it deals with ambivalence, which is one of the key features of um, both being a uh, ethnic minority in a majority culture and seeking mint, which is a representative pillar of the institutions of the majority culture. By definition, there is typically ambivalence there, right? With your asking me to change things about myself, and I'm very worried about changing who I am at a fundamental level, is among the many ambivalences that occur in therapy. And so it might be nice because it, it likes ambivalence. 